there's been a huge revival in the appreciation and the understanding of the author Dostoevsky, Fyodor Dostoevsky, who lived in the 19th century in Russia. He's the author of books like Crime and Punishment, Brothers Karamazov, The Idiot, books that you repeatedly hear called classics, called some of the greatest novels ever written. I think this drives people to definitely look at them, especially when now public figures, scholars, ideologues are all uh, starting to promote him and recommend them to people. Um, Putin's spiritual leader, um, Alexander Dugin, is almost this this channeler uh, of Dostoevsky's uh, beliefs. Dostoevsky had very uh, almost fascistic and almost um, um, theocratic, or definitely actually theocratic designs for the future of Russia, um, which he went on about in his letters and uh, publication he had called A Writer's Diary. And yet what I hear over and over again are the same kinds of questions like, where should I start? What should I read next? I read something and I don't understand it. Um, there are people starting with Brothers Karamazov, starting with uh, demons. Uh, I think people should uh, have a little bit more guidance when it comes to how they approach Dostoevsky as a writer and how they can get the most out of reading. him. Now, in case my hair makes me look too insane, I am definitely a a uh, private enjoyer of Dostoevsky. Um, I didn't. I don't have a degree or anything. Um, I didn't study him. I don't know any Russian. But there's such an incredible community around Dostoevsky. Um, not only like things like there's a subreddit. Uh, there are message boards. There's um, a lot going on in academia now. People who are putting Dostoevsky on the syllabus. People who are prioritizing books like The Idiot and The Brothers Karamazov, especially in um, schools that study theology, uh, the Divinity School at Harvard, for example. Um, and so people have this massive interest in him. Again. What we're going to do in this video is I'm going to walk you through his brief biography, which it's not good to make his biography brief. He has one of the most interesting biographies out of any writer by far. There are scholars like Erwin Weil, um, Joseph Frank, who is the most accomplished biographer of Dostoevsky, um, who wrote a one-volume, or if you'd like, a four-volume biography. The one volume I'll put in the description is called A Writer in His Time. Uh, Joseph Frank is considered the authority on Dostoevsky. If you want to learn anything about him, you can definitely check out his work. Um, but otherwise, looking over the Wikipedia article uh, does a good job, and other there's so much stuff on the internet. I really recommend you just Google it. Um, but we're going to go through his biography. I'm going to go through his major works. There's about five novels that they call the five greats. And I'm also going to talk about some um, peripheral great works. All of his works are just phenomenal. Um, and I'm going to give advice on how you should be approaching his books um, in general or with specificity. We can go all up and down the chain of command. Now, just briefly, and I hate to make his biography brief, Dostoevsky was born in Moscow in 1821. His father was a military doctor. They were on the lower rungs of the aristocracy, but they were definitely there. Um, they could survive off of their salary. Um, interestingly, Dostoevsky grew up in a sanatorium, in like a home for people who were mentally deranged. Um, it's, he was exposed to fascinating people. His father and his family promoted his fascination with literature from a young age, and he got to know an interesting um collection of people. His brother, he maintained correspondence with his brother from the time he was a teenager, talking about Schiller, talking about Shakespeare. Uh, Dostoevsky was kind of born to be a writer. Um, and so the fact that his biography is called A Writer in His Time is incredibly apt. Um, he was a writer who was influenced by exactly what was happening in his lifetime. Um, of course, many authors fit this description. Dostoevsky really is possibly the epitome of this. Um, he was on top of the discussions. He was at the forefront. He was literally a trailblazer for these discussions. Um, as we'll find out, let's get through his biography. He went to military school for engineering and design. He was a great illustrator, but he hated that. He didn't want to be a part of it. And he, had, he was famous at his academy for showing resistance to the, the leadership there, to the, <laughs> the headmaster. And when he got out of there, he didn't go into the military. He didn't get a job. He wanted to be a writer. Um, he started publishing, and the first thing he ever wrote, I believe he was still in school, in fact, was a translation of a book by Honor de Balzac, 
which was pretty popular. He wrote a book called Poor Folk, uh, his first novel, which is an epistolary novel. It's not very long and it's really fascinating. It's, a, it's an exchange of letters between two main characters and it's almost like a posh lust. It's almost like a description of normal people. That would become Dostoevsky's hallmark uh, among, among many <laughs> very eminent hallmarks is he describes normal people in a very detailed and a very gritty way to contrast with Tolstoy who has very even, very measured, and very uh, insightful sentences. Dostoevsky is burning through information. He is, he is allowing the story to exist on its own. He is dishing it out to you with great efficiency, frenetic and fiery and electric, completely, completely distinct in his day and age. Um, or to contrast with Turgenev, this writer who wrote almost nonchalantly, it's like he wrote his novels with like a glass of brandy and a cigar, like, oh, I guess so. <laughs> In the beginning of his books, he says, like, people asked me to write this down, so I just <laughs> banged it out and here it is. Uh, or Bunin, who actually didn't like Dostoevsky because Dostoevsky was too blunt, too forward. Absolutely. If you take nothing else away from this video, just remember, Dostoevsky gets to the point. He tells you what you need to hear. There are no, they, they don't have the kinds of literary games being played like in other novels. He has a completely different song. His song is very direct, um, very well stated. He wrote frenetically and he wrote in short time frames to make sure that he was paying his debts, which we will learn about. Um, there was a great writer at this time in uh, Dostoevsky's early 20s. This writer was named Belinsky. Belinsky was like the John Lennon of Russia at the time, before 1850. I believe he only died a few years after he met Dostoevsky. He was so fascinated by Dostoevsky's work, he ran over to Dostoevsky's apartment at like three in the morning, knocked on the door and said, you are the greatest writer in Russia, you know, just praising him. And he treated Dostoevsky as kind of this calendar kid uh, for the movement and for the literary world in Russia at the time. What's very important is that Belinsky was a pro-Western thinker. He was a philosopher and a writer. Um, he thought the West should have more presence. Western thought, French thought, English thought should have more prevalence in Russia. Dostoevsky loved writers. Like, again, Balzac, absolutely incredible. Um, Flaubert, absolutely worshipped him. He worshipped Charles Dickens. Dostoevsky knew his great literature. Um, and so Dostoevsky was kind of pro-Western at this time. He actually went to rallies. He actually um, was kind of vocal about it. But you could tell at the same time, he wasn't gung-ho. He wasn't nearly as gung-ho about this as he was later in his life. In fact, Dostoevsky is, I hate it when people accuse Dostoevsky of being a nihilist, of being a depressing writer. Because his books, let's, let's face it, have incredibly depressing stuff in them. Murder, deception, all of these things. It's, it's everything. Um, there was a chapter in the book uh, Devils, a.k.a. Demons, a.k.a. The Possessed, that was originally removed from the book because it was too graphic. It was too much for that audience. Um, Dostoevsky did not hide the truth of how he thought of what was going through his mind. The true philosophical investigation. This had not expressed itself yet in his writing. Um, he got involved with a radical group called the Petrushevsky Circle. It's people who were protesting the czar, the czardom, as they call it, on very specific points. They were not radical. I mean, they were radical in their ideas. They did not want to put together a protest. They did not want to take the czar out of power. They thought that Russians should be able to read, they should be educated. Uh, because at this time, there's only a few million people probably in Russia who can even read. Um, literacy was extremely low. That means kind of one of two things. Number one, this is a big body of readers. I mean, you have to compete. Millions of people is not just a few people. Uh, people loved reading. Reading was the main way of enjoying and kind of having entertainment in a private sense. Uh, reading was serialized. When you look at these massive novels, like, I don't know, look, look at all these Dostoevsky books. These were serialized. These were usually published in journals. When you look at War and Peace, this brick of a book you could just murder someone with, that was published over the course of many years. In fact, it was published in the same journal, sometimes back to back, with books, I, I believe, 
Anna Karenina was published with Crime and Punishment, and I think War and Peace might have been with um, Brothers Karamazov. I mean, so you have some of the greatest literature ever written in the same journals. They were serialized. It's something that people would pick up and they would read over time. Anyway, Dostoevsky was involved in the Petrushevsky circle. Not good. It doesn't look good. At one meeting, the secret police, and yes, secret police were a thing long before the Soviet Union, which we will get back to. They burst in and arrest everyone. All of the members of the Petrushevsky circle are then put in jail and their fate is decided. Among the people deciding their fate was the adjutant general, Ivan Nabokov, the grandfather of the writer, Vladimir Nabokov. Vladimir Nabokov actually fled Russia when he was a child to avoid the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, his life came very close to overlapping with Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky died, I believe, when he was 60 or so. He could have lived a bit longer, um, but he had serious issues. Um, Nabokov actually knew, or his family was close to people that Dostoevsky knew personally. He felt himself very close. Nabokov ended up being very critical of Dostoevsky, um, unfortunately. And I think his criticisms are pretty baseless, but uh, you can't you can't knock Nabokov. He has had some of the most revolutionary opinions about many, many authors. He's one of the main reasons we can understand and enjoy Jane Austen to this day. His analyses are phenomenal. Um, Dostoevsky's arrested. Um, Nabokov's grandpa is one of the people to decide that these people will be executed. So they spend a long time in these horrible conditions in jail. Then they are led out to a killing field. What's important that I've discovered, just reading what I've read, Dostoevsky and the Petrushevskys were led forward and a succession of four people uh, in each group were executed in front of their very eyes. They were shot. Many people call this a mock execution. I don't think it was mock at all. And the reason why is because right before Dostoevsky and his three comrades were meant to move forward, um, they were pardoned. A courier came up and said, the czar has pardoned these men. One of them apparently went insane on the spot. I don't know who would report this aside from Dostoevsky. Um, but this is the pinnacle of Dostoevsky's life. He goes into this moment many times in literature particularly in The Idiot, the main character talks about the idea of having a false execution or, or the, the idea of being let out to your execution. It changed Dostoevsky's life. Um, because his execution was commuted, um, Dostoevsky lived for four years in a hard labor camp in Siberia, the Gulag, only it wouldn't be called the Gulag until the Soviet Union times, but it was still the same thing physical, mental, psychological torture in every way, pointless labor. Sometimes it was productive. Sometimes they would do it just to drive people crazy. They lived next to cockroaches. They had no sanitation. Their diet was dismal. Um, they could barely buy anything. Um, the only thing they were allowed to read were the synoptic gospels. They gave the gospels to anyone who wanted it. Dostoevsky memorized them. This, these gospels, the life of Christ, would become a blueprint for almost everything he wrote. If it wasn't a character, it would be a plot arc. If it wasn't um, a philosophical discussion, it would be a minute detail or something. He was a master of the life of Christ. And again, books and writers that were heavily inspired by him, for example, Bulgakov, Master and Margarita, possibly my favorite novel of all time. It would be competing with the idiot. Um, he directly, he writes a book about the life of Christ. And it becomes this wonderful allegory for what we are experiencing and how we rationalize suffering in the world. Dostoevsky would also closely study the book of Job. What is suffering? How do we rationalize it? How do we internalize it? How do we make it a part of our lives? Um, Dostoevsky did not write in complicated or elusive subjects. He wrote things that people thought about all the time that I think about. I'm not even religious. I don't really believe in God, but Dostoevsky is possibly the only writer, in my opinion, who would compel someone to consider God uh, or consider the existence of God, or at least the importance of Christian values, even if they are atheistic, even if they are militantly 
against the idea of God and religion. The Brothers Karamazov is, in my opinion, the most powerful argument for Christian theology um, in the world. I think it slices through the values promoted by atheism, in fact, but I still don't believe in God and I won't be a Christian, but it just goes to show <laughs> Dostoevsky's influence. So Dostoevsky lives in this uh, camp, becomes very important for him. Um, and then he spends four years in the military and then he comes back into the world, immediately starts writing again. Now I'm gonna condense the rest of his biography. He writes successful novels in the 1860s. He has to run away from Russia to get away from his gambling debts where one of his, um, where his wife gives birth to a daughter. By the way, Dostoevsky became epileptic um, or he began, his epilepsy was more pronounced um, in his time at the Siberian work camp. He would have seizures all the time. While he was in, I believe, Switzerland, evading his debts in Russia, his wife began to conceive and he had a fit. He was not able to catch or go call for a midwife. And so his daughter was improperly born and she died three months later. This haunted him horrendously. He went to a gallery where he saw Hans Holbein's dead savior, influenced him heavily. He eventually went back to, oh, by the way, he had a gambling addiction, uh, which consumed a huge part of his life uh, also in the uh, 60s. By the 1870s, I believe he's back in Russia, primarily in St. Petersburg, Petersburg. This is the last decade of his life. Um, he becomes focused on publishing and being a writer. He has a regular publication called A Writer's Diary, um, in which he talks about his thoughts. A lot of his short stories are published there. Um, it's phenomenal short stories. He was never off. Nothing he ever wrote was just down or kind of off, you know, out of tune. Everything was incisive. Even towards the end of his life, one of the last short works he ever wrote called A Dream of a Ridiculous Man, it smacks of his early novels. He's just Dusty, the same Dostoevsky from start to finish. One of these in, indomitable wills in history. Um, he gives a phenomenal speech um, towards the end of his life on the anniversary of Pushkin's death. It might be one of the main things he was remembered for um, before the Bolshevik Revolution. Tolstoy um, wrote extremely sentimental things about Dostoevsky. He said that after Dostoevsky died, you know, he would be sitting at breakfast and realize, oh my God, he's dead. And he would feel a void in his heart. I believe Tolstoy's last novels, which were much more focused, much more existential, much more incisive, were channeling this, 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 this raw energy, this ruggedness that Dostoevsky embodied. Hajim Yorat, the last, the posthumously published Tolstoy novel, um, Resurrection, Death of Ivan Illich, I think were very personal. Um, and I believe, it's my opinion, that Dostoevsky, um, the ghost was moving in <laughs> Tolstoy. Um, and so I, I believe, uh, I forget why Dostoevsky died in particular. Oh, 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 I forgot to mention, when Dostoevsky was 12, his father was murdered at their summer estate. <laughs> Pretty important, especially for his last novel. Um, Dostoevsky felt guilt about that. He felt guilt that his own father was murdered. It's incredible. I believe he was even perplexed by this. I haven't read all of his letters. I haven't read all of a writer's diary. I've tried to. I've, I'm getting through it, but I haven't seen evidence. But you get the feeling that that's why he wrote it, wrote this fact into some of his novels. Now we're going to go through the novels. And this is the part where I'm going to start to say, start with this book. Don't start with that one. Don't start with that one. So he wrote Poor Folk. He wrote um, another book after that called The Double, which I believe was inspired by a, uh, a work called The Overcoat by Nikolai Gogol. Gogol is absolutely worshipped in Russia. He's one of the greatest lyrical prose artists or, or, or playwrights, lyricists in Russian literature. Dead Souls is one of the funniest novels you'll ever read. Um, I'll, in the description, I'll put a link to the Gurney translation, which is the absolute best. He, 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 um, he comprehends and he represents the humor beautifully. Other translations, it's so hard to do it in, Ru in English. The Russian is so peculiar. And this book that Dostoevsky wrote called The Double, which was based on, or probably inspired directly by Gogol, flopped really hard in Russia. This was after his 
you know, uh, breadwinning poor folk, which was great. His friend Belinsky, if you remember him, was so disappointed in the double. He couldn't believe Dostoevsky would write this. I've read it. It's okay. Nabokov loved it. I didn't like it in particular. It's whatever. It's a, it's almost like one of those sci-fi or like Twilight Zone things where it's like someone, a man finds his doppelganger. If it, it's it's great if you like that. He wrote some short works. Uh, he went to the camp, la di da. He comes back and he writes in 1862, he publishes Notes from the <laughs> Notes of a Dead House, which is the literal translation. We call it House of the Dead. It's about his experiences at the work camp, but he, 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 he doesn't call himself Fyodor Dostoevsky. He's using a character. He's partially fictionalizing it, probably because it's the, the Tsardom, like he's already, he's already touched the fire. He's not gonna touch it again. Um, it's phenomenal. It's one of the most incredible novels you ever read. It really smacks of Shawshank Redemption, Paul, uh, Paul Newman, what is it? Cool Hand Luke, um, Papillon, definitely. But Dostoevsky is, is more brutal, serious, existential, you know. Um, there's, there's a part where the prisoners put on a play, for example, and it's like they're finally alive. Um, House of the Dead is full of, 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 of not blood and guts, but grit, horrible conditions. What is absolutely amazing is that was published in 1860, 1862. Exactly 100 years later, in 1962, um, Alexander Solnitsyn would put put out a day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, which is about the exact same thing. Um, Solnitsyn was in the Gulag, and he wrote, his entire um, his legacy is journalizing his experiences in the Gulag, and he was also explosive. Uh, as time goes, uh, explosively received. As time goes on, people start to recognize Dostoevsky for being so prophetic, for representing the life in the times and, 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 and predicting the future so accurately. There will be another, another novel that practically predicts the Soviet Union's character, behavior, history to a T. He predicts the 20th century in Russia beautifully in a later novel. But for now, House of the Dead, very straightforward, wonderfully written. Um, if you want to start with House of the Dead, you would, you would do no wrong. It's short. It's serious. The novel after that, this is where the debate about nihilism comes in. Um, the novel he publishes next is called Notes from the Underground. Extremely iconic. Um, it's like a monologue from a strange man we call the underground man. Underground, I believe in the, the Russian refers to like a passageway in a cellar. Like just, just someone who's below society looking up, you know. He is very proudly spiteful. The first lines are, I am a wicked man. I am a spiteful man. That's how the novel starts. He says, I think there's something wrong with my liver. You know, he's self-obsessed. He's talking about society as this external thing. He is commenting on society. There's a lot going on, but he mainly is criticizing an actual book that was published, published um, shortly before called um, What is to be Done? by the philosopher Chernyshevsky. Chernyshevsky would later inspire people, along with Charles Fourier, who was a French um, uh, political scientist and, and philosopher, would inspire Karl Marx to write Das Kapital, the Communist Manifesto. Um, Chernyshevsky was a nihilist. He was mainly writing in protest to the Habsburg governments, which were controlling all of Russia and all of Europe. Everyone was a Habsburg, a Tsar Nicholas, Tsar Alexander. It's all just the same family. Nobody elected them. Um, they're draining Russia of physical resources, oppressing Russia, keeping Russia illiterate. Um, they were practically atheistic. They're like an atheist invader. Um, or they were pushing, putting forward these ridiculous kinds of Christianity that, that, that were offensive to Russian sensibilities. Um, Chernyshevsky wanted to resist this by instituting this commune-based society that didn't believe in religion, that didn't believe in any of the societal crap. People were working for one another. And so it's kind of a utopian, it's a nihilist, it's a socialist um, doctrine. Charles Fourier directly promoted socialism and he was heavily commented on, especially if you look up the writer Bastiat in La Lay, he is lampooning the idea of socialism very effectively. 
Dostoevsky was anti Chernyshevsky from the very beginning. As soon as he was out of the, the work camp, Dostoevsky was a theocrat. Dostoevsky was anti nihilism. He was a Christian absolutist. There is perhaps no more Christian author in all of history um, than Dostoevsky. Even Pilgrim's Progress, what is it, John Bunyan? He, Dostoevsky blows him out of the water. Pilgrim's Progress is a bunch of. <laughs> It's a toilet read, whatever. Um, Dostoevsky didn't agree with nihilism. The underground man, in Notes from the Underground, he talks like a nihilist. He talks like a cynic, a bitter man. He literally calls himself a spiteful man. Um, I recommend the original English translation by um, a translator named Constance Garnett. She had the original... Um, she was the bridge from the original Russian into the English market. And so she introduced Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and all these authors, probably to James Joyce, probably to um, Hemingway, certainly to a lot of those writers. Um, I recommend her translation because she uses the word spiteful in the very beginning. The underground man defines himself according to spite. One of his famous quotes is many people would hold that two plus two equals four. It makes sense. He says a true free individual, someone with preserved will, should be able to say two plus two equals five and not look back. Because, and this is something that will recur over and over again in Dostoevsky's literature. Rational logic is a prison. It's just momentary. It's completely incidental to the real world. Dostoevsky equates the real world, literally what you are dealing with around you, with Satan, with Satan's meddling. It's complicated. Everyone's relationship is a web that you just get caught in. People are exploitative. People without God in the world, Dostoevsky spends his lifetime arguing, people without God are eating each other alive. Um, the idiot addresses this directly. Brothers Karamazov addresses this devils, a.k.a. demons, a.k.a. This, the possessed. There are many translations. Um, again, it's the same thing. Crime and punishment to an extent. Um, the brothers Karamazov, all of them, are just talking about like rational logic is not the end of the world. It's just going to drive people crazy. It's going to cause tragedy. You need something more, and that something more is religion, God, because it is transcendent. It can move over these momentary, these temporal issues, effortlessly. It can, you can see outside of everything that's going on. Blind faith is actually an incredible weapon against anything that you could possibly encounter. This is what I mean when I say that um, his, his kind of Christianity, his, his theological meditations exceed everyone else. He's absolutely right. Who wants to deal with any of this? Who wants to owe money? Who wants to be caught in a love triangle? Our ideas, our willpower is more important than any of this. The human being itself is more important. And a human being is not represented in a socialist network, not represented by nihilism. It's anti-human. It causes assimilation. It's deterministic. And Dostoevsky resisted any kind of determinism. He believes free will is something we have to get used to. We have free will. No matter how much we try to convince ourselves that we are caught in these patterns of behavior, no matter how much we try to justify what we do. Justification is an admission of guilt, that we are doing something because we need a reason. Um, a free person believes in good, believes in their projects, and believes in what there should be in the world. This is what is explored directly in the Brothers Karamazov, and we see it as early as Notes from the Underground. After this, he writes, the classic, you heard it before, Crime and Punishment. This is based off of something that he read in the news. A man, I believe, murders, I think a usurer, a moneylender. Um, and he wrote a novel based on this. You always see this in like, people have read this in high school. They're like, ah, oh, geez, Crime and Punishment. They mix it up with Civil Disobedience by Henry David Thoreau, which you should also read. Um, this is a thick one. This one is uh, over 500 pages. Now, listen to me. Dostoevsky's novels are pretty big. Uh, I have Brothers K in digital just so I can kind of skim through it really fast. 
but it's even it's like eight eight nine hundred. This is about six seven hundred devils. This is five hundred. The idiot is close to five or six hundred. Um, you have to listen to me when I say you will buzz through these books. The way he writes, the way Dostoevsky thinks, it's almost conversational. Again, he was writing against debt all the time. He, he often he would get an advance payment, which he would live on for two years and then write the book in the last like two months, which is definitely true of The Idiot. He crunched The Idiot out. We'll get to that later. Crime and Punishment was this major um, event in his literary career. It's about a young man, I believe he's 23, living in St. Petersburg named Raskolnikov, Rodion Romanovich uh, Raskolnikov, whom I'll call Rodia, which is the diminutive. There will be a lot of diminutives that people share, Rodia, Vanya, Vanyechka, Ivan, Ivan. Uh, um, there's only one Dmitri, I think, in all the books, so fortunately, but anyway, there's Ilyushas, Alyoshas, you know. Rodia um, has a sister and a mother whom he has to take care of, but they're all broke. Um, and he's completely disillusioned. He's a student. He was famous for writing some pamphlets or something. He's very outspoken. Um, and he has big ideas about history. Now, Rodia comes up with an idea called the extraordinary man. He looks at people like Napoleon. He asks, why can Napoleon get away with this? I mean, he caused untold suffering. He, his death toll is astronomical. Um, even in Dostoevsky's lifetime, the, the entire 19th century is structured on avoiding another Napoleon, this obsession with universality. Look, we can all get along. This idea of this new balance of power, especially centered on England and Russia. Russia was really more like a piggy bank than an actual polarity. Um, the, the, the importance of having this Habsburg network, this cohesive network that was not admitting to um, um, upheaval and discord like we saw in the French Revolution that primed Central Europe for a Napoleon to come out and steal the horses. And Raskolnikov is wondering like, okay, I'm trapped in, in this miserable state. My sister might have to prostitute herself just to get by. I have nothing I can do. I just write pamphlets. I owe this woman named Lizaveta money. Uh, Lizaveta is a money lender, a usurer. In Crime and Punishment, especially in this translation, they call her a pawnbroker. That doesn't quite uh, translate. I don't remember the Russian, but the Russian is more like usurer or money lender or loan shark or something like that. People are not just selling their things. It's more like collateral or they owe her money. Rodia thinks that if I just kill this woman, and this is not a spoiler, this is like the point of the book. If I just kill this woman, he says it's mere arithmetic that everything will get better. All the people who owe her money will be free. They can get out of there. He'll steal some of her stuff hide it, take it back, and they'll go to America or something. Um, and he says it's mere arithmetic. That reminds you directly of notes from the underground. The, the underground man lampooned the idea that we have, to, we, you know, we have to faithfully, perfectly follow rational logic. That it's not human. It's not how people think. Now we have Rodia depending on mere arithmetic, patterns of thought, patterns of behavior, to guide him. What does he do? He takes an ax and he murders this woman. Now, this is kind of a spoiler, but this is something that should really give food for thought. When he murders this pawnbroker, her sister is there too, and he has to murder her as well. That's really the, 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 the wedge in the book. That's one of the things that he starts to grapple with. It just, he really has to face the fact that there are victims of his crime beyond the target. Um, th there's the phrase, step over blood. Can you ignore blood? Can you step over these tragic events and ascend to a, a will to power, as we will later call it? Um, Schopenhauer talked about will to live. Nietzsche adapted it to, and thus spoke that Zarathustra in the gay science, to a will to power. What is incredible, and by the way, Nietzsche worshipped Dostoevsky. He said that Dostoevsky was the only person from whom he had ever learned about psychology, primarily with reference to um, a short story called The Landlady and Crime and Punishment. In Crime and Punishment, the extraordinary man is an ideal like an Ubermensch or something. 
Um, can you can the will persevere over everything else? The, the truth is, yes, it can. Um, the, uh, <laughs> Rodia commits the murder in the book. And what's incredible, as Nietzsche comments, is will and the will to succeed, the will to overcome obstacles, the will to power transcends everything, even our sensibility about survival. We will risk our lives to ascend to a position of power. It almost doesn't make any sense. And it's only evident in intelligent creatures like people. Um, and it's this incredible um, and precarious fact that is explored in depth in Crime and Punishment, a very Nietzschean book before Nietzsche <laughs> was even doing it. Um, again, the punishment in the novel, in my opinion, is really Rodia living with what he had done. He lives with the fact that he really is getting away with it. If he wanted to in this book, honestly, I think he could have just gone, gotten away. Um, you will see what happens, though. It's very complicated. Um, the ending, people consider it kind of a flop. I don't think the ending should affect your opinion on the book in the slightest. The translation I recommend for this, um, this one is by two translators named Richard Pevere and Larissa Volokonsky. These are very divisive translators. What they do is Larissa Volokonsky is bilingual. She translates from the original, original Russian directly so that it probably doesn't make any sense. Richard then comes along and touches it up. He tries to avoid the responsibility of creating a new narrative, creating prose. He wants to simply touch it up. Sometimes it comes out very choppy. Sometimes the words they choose are not the best. This, this edition, I think, is fine. They always have extensive notes in the back. They usually write their own introductions, uh, translator notes here, for example. If you have any confusion, you can look it up. Or they have the um, free translations of the public domain for all of Dostoevsky on Project Gutenberg, which I'll put in the description. This copy is perfectly fine. Uh, the, this is an older one. So, like, for example, I can, I can literally scrape the, the title page off. Um, but their translation is great. Um, the only criticism is in the very beginning, there's a drunk man. By the way, this was originally called The Drunkards, and it was the story was originally just about a character, Marmeladov, whom you meet in the very beginning. A father who, he says, was burglarized, not by a person, but by alcohol. He said everything slowly emptied out of his apartment until he had pawned away his entire life. Just drinking. And... Um, Dostoevsky later conceived of Rodia or the Raskolnikov plot, which he kind of came to consume the original one called the drunkards. Marmeladov says there's a difference between, as they translate it, poverty and destitution, which are perfect synonyms in English. The Russian is slightly different. The connotation is there's a difference between simply being poor and living almost the way of being poor. If you have no money, well, nobody has any money. Everyone's poor. But it's something about giving in. It's something about almost the fight or flight of it that really is a, is a big difference. And I think that Marmeladov is saying, don't be like me. Don't buy into this fight or flight kind of idea, which Rodia does, <laughs> as you immediately find out. Crime and Punishment overall is a hilarious book. It has some really funny parts to it. It's, it's really nerve-wracking. Um, in, in an entertaining way. I mean, you're following a guy who murdered someone. How bad do you really feel for him? I don't sympathize. I mean, hold on. At the end of the day, I don't sympathize with uh, Raskolnikov. But for a guy who literally murders someone as a main plot point, you sympathize with him all throughout the book. I mean, it's incredible. Um, you really are seeing into the mind of a killer. And he's not like a psycho. He's not like a Dahmer or anything. He is a normal person off the street who comes up with this plan, hiding money, uh, the guilt about what he has done, trying to uh, talk to a police officer, an investigator named Porphyry, who is following him around. Incredible. One of the most dramatic novels ever written. Far from a dusty bookshelf, you know, assigned read that, their, that its reputation lends to it. Far from a high school read. I mean, it is a fascinating book. That's crime and punishment. Dostoevsky then, after this, he will flee Russia. He will live in a um, in Switzerland in a town with lots of casinos and gamble away not only all of his money, which he doesn't have because he owes loads of people in Russia, 
all of his wife's money. She requests all of these goods and all of this wealth from her family in Russia just so he can, quote, get it out of his system. So he impoverishes them. Soon after this, again, there's the birth in which he um, has an, an epileptic fit and he cannot uh, fetch for a midwife. The child dies a few months later. Um, he is racked with guilt. He observes the Hans Holbein painting, Dead Christ. Within two years, he has written the book, The Idiot. Now, right before this, he wrote The Gambler. Is The Gambler good? Yes. Should you start with it? Yeah, sure. Why not? I would recommend Notes from the Underground or House of the Dead. And I would recommend the public domain, the Constance Garnet translations, which you can get through Project Gutenberg. This translation of The Idiot is again by Richard Bevere and Larissa Volokonsky. I like these just because they have notes in the back, if that's what you want. These are considered literal translations. I've only ever translated Latin and Greek, ancient Latin and Greek. I don't think their method is very legitimate. You need to have authorship of a new prose story that you're writing. I've translated the Aeneid. There's absolutely no way to translate um, Virgil's nuances within the actual stanzas into an English body of text. You cannot represent the syntax in which two components in the vocabulary of a cave are enclosing the, enclosing the characters of Dido and Aeneas within the cave, while also referencing the love between one another. It's not going to happen. You don't need to translate it. And even if you did, it wouldn't make a difference. Um, they fortunately avoid this conversation altogether. If you like that, go ahead and get their copy of Idiot. My recommendation for the Idiot would probably be either the Garnet, I believe, or let me very quickly. <sighs> yeah, the Garnet. And by the way, I mean, you can get it on the internet. Get these books in paper. Again, I have Brothers Karamazov on my Kindle just because it's so much and I have to go through a lot of it. So I just do it on the computer. Get these in paper. It's absolutely, especially these editions, it's, it's very nicely framed and everything. Now, where to start with the idiot? Um, would I, would, would, should you start with this book? I don't think so. This should be at least two or three down the line. And by the way, I know what you're thinking. Oh, I'm just going to read one Dostoevsky book. This is like an addiction. And I'm not even joking. Like once you've read one Dostoevsky novel, you'd feel like an idiot for stopping there. It's like reading a journal. It's like reading a paperback. But it, there's so much more content. There's so much more depth and substance. You will definitely end up with The Idiot. In fact, his longest novel, The Brothers Karamazov, I guarantee you'll read it more than once. I'm on my third read, <laughs> just in my spare time, just on the bus. Um, originally, Dostoevsky, after seeing the painting Dead Christ by Hans Holbein and losing his daughter, wanted to create a book about an evil man who does evil things and then becomes good in some way, like a reverse Walter White. He just, it just was a stop and start. He never quite went through with it. Towards the very end of two years, um, his, his, the kinder of his, the people lending him money were kind of getting to the end of their rope. He wrote a new story that he had been kind of gestating for a long time about a perfectly good man, a perfectly Christian man who is naive. He is so beautiful. He calls him the, uh, a, a perfectly beautiful man, in fact, named Prince Mishkin. Mishkin is a, in his mid-20s, and he's returning to Russia on a very foggy, a very dreary day in St. Petersburg after spending six years uh, in therapy for insanity in Switzerland, originally supported by a family friend named Pavlishev who passes away. He then lives the last two years out of pocket from the doctor who was taking care of him. Once that ran out, he returns to Russia to um, make contact with, I believe, it was a, yeah, Katerina Ivanovna, who was a distant relative of his and also relatively aristocratic. Prince Mishkin is called Prince Mishkin simply because he comes from an old family. The, uh, the accessories of his aristocratic nature are all gone. He has no money. Um, he only has what's in his bag, as we are, as is described in the first pages. He's on a train arriving at the station, and he finds, after the fog clears, he's sitting across from another man named Rogozhin, um, who is kind of being screwed out of his father's inheritance. And so he's badgering this family that Michigan is going to meet um, to kind of 
agitate. He also has romantic designs on a woman we'll meet. Now, they both uh, end up going to this family's um, living room. It's called the Yepenshin family. General Yepenshin is kind of the patriarch. His wife is Katerina Ivanovna, who invites Mishkin in. Of course, Prince Mishkin. They kind of are meeting him for the first time, though. They maybe have heard of him, but he's the only Prince Mishkin in Russia, which is phenomenal to them, or fascinating, rather. And there's a whole circle of people surrounding them. General Yepenshin's friend named Totsky is a man who um, adopted and brought up a young girl named Nastasia Filipovna, one of the main characters. Totsky also sexually took advantage of her in her youth. This causes her to have a very unique, a very fiery, and a very vengeful and just acerbic personality. There's a character named Gavri Gavrila Ardalyanovich who is trying to get uh, marry Nastasia Filipovna so that he can get to Totsky's wealth. Um, she tortures him through his fake love. She, he offers 75,000 rubles. At that time, is just a ridiculous amount of money in hand to marry him. She throws it into the fire and tells him to retrieve it on his hands and knees, which he does. And it's just embarrassing. It just ruins the entire proposal. As time goes on, Mishkin and the reader become aware of the maddening, just the insane relationships among these people, um, trying to exploit one another, causing this ridiculous drama. These characters are often described by readers as being completely unrealistic. They're like Kardashians, to be quite honest, just putting idiots almost, um, putting this drama forward when it's not invited. Um, all because um, they, they are reacting towards the entire scheme of it. Um, even General Yepanchin is, is, is embroiled in this. Katerina Ivanovna is just kind of this reactionary. Um, Nastasia Filipovna is this almost agitator. And then there's the character Aglaya, another love interest of Prince Mishkin. Um, and so it's very complicated. It's a love triangle and it's a square and it's a pentagon. Like it's, it's ridiculous, full of intrigue and aristocratic um, hubbub. What is the point of this book? People read it and they say, oh, well, it's just people sitting in a room talking for paragraphs at a time. There are people who run in and try to exploit Mishkin for his um, uh, some scandal so they can make money off of the journalism. There's people who are trying to get to Nastasia Filipovna. There's Rogozhin, whom we learn is actually kind of an antagonist and an antichrist, if not a satanic figure in the book. What does it all mean? And it's true. There's a lot of dialogue in this. It's mainly a dialogue book. We're going to now just <laughs> go into why this is possibly my favorite book of all time. While Dostoevsky was writing it, he had no idea what was going to happen next. He was writing this book blind. He was equally as amazed at everything that happened. Now, the ending of this book, and there are perhaps there's perhaps no other book ever, that's at least that I've read, that hinges on the ending quite as essentially as the idiot. This entire book is the ending. The book, I mean, as you read through it, you have these fascinating ideas, these fascinating events, but it's all actuated through the very, very ending. And uh, what was my original point? Even Dostoevsky writes to someone that he was floored by what happened at the end of the book, even though he was the one writing it. For days, he was just dazzled by what he had come up with. And so this is a forward-thinking book. It's a book that is constantly anticipating what's going to happen next. You are literally sitting beside Dostoevsky, watching this book unfold. And the, this fact of the book is incredibly downplayed. I mean, this is the point of the book. Um, absolutely fascinating. Um, the dialogue, you don't need to get embroiled in it. I mean, you're embroiled in it kind of as a point. Mishkin is, he's a beautiful man in the sense that he doesn't care about any of this, uh, the complicated nature of being involved in other people, the exploitation, the intrigue, the, the, the ruckus, if you would. He doesn't get involved in it. He's almost ethereal. He is called an idiot. Because he's not paying attention to what's happening in the world. He's focused on his own ideals about beauty. He's perfect. He forgives everyone. He only acts in ways that make people feel better, that improve their condition. And it's this baseness, this simplicity, this beauty 
that is ultimately extremely destructive to the people you encounter. Because these solutions, the world here, it's organic. It has things happening. Um, it needs someone who's not an idiot to get involved. And they're almost trapped by his, um, um, his simplicity. And they do look down on him. But at the same time, there are people who uh, are seeking his hand. They're trying to seek his hand as a refuge from the other things they have to deal with. Nastasia Filipovna almost can't say no. Um, and yet the way that he goes about these things, it causes tragedy, despite the fact that he's this perfectly beautiful man, but he's still pathetic. Um, and that's the main thing, really. What is the difference between absolute ideal beauty and the real world? The real world is dark, it's foggy, it's full of these yellowing people, these people who are just at war with one another, and they can't see past it. The people throughout the book, despite looking down on Mishkin, are still floored by what he comes out with. His, his views on morality, on human nature, he just absentmindedly mentions these incredible things. Um, he even, he goes into uh, the, the, the experience of going through an, ex an execution. He talks about things, and he's an epileptic as well. Um, Joseph Frank calls this possibly Dostoevsky's most personal novel, because Mishkin really is Dostoevsky. He felt himself too small, too simple, too ideal for the world, bowled over, absolutely bulldozed by the world. Um, and this is his kind of, his kind of yop. This is his um, expression of that. And it's incredible. I absolutely recommend you read The Idiot at some point. Don't get bogged down and hmm, what's the meaning of this? See what's happening. Go through it. There are some hilarious scenes. There are some amazing scenes. Um, people you feel are annoying throughout the book, you'll have a completely different view by the end of it because the ending truly is just in a way. After that, Dostoevsky starts hearing about um, things that are going on at universities. I believe at an agricultural university, some politically minded students or something uh, end up murdering someone for his views. These students were the Nishayevists, uh, based around a man or a student named Nishayev, who was trying to put forward nihilism and this kind of communist and socialism. You know, Dostoevsky was very interested in what young people were doing. From his brother-in-law, he heard about this murder at the same school. Um, the, they murdered someone who was one of their friends who was actually religious. He believed in the Romanovs. He believed in theocracy. And he was killed. Phenomenal. Um, these were completely innocuous people who committed it. And so Dostoevsky began with a book that he called Life of a Great Sinner, which eventually became Devils, a.k.a. Demons, a.k.a. The Possessed. Um, this translator, Michael R. Katz, which I do recommend uh, for the translation for this book, very candid, very straightforward. Katz knows what's going on and he's commenting on it. That's what a translator should do. Um, represents the prose very well. Um, in Devils, it's about a town in Russia. And there's this brilliant man named Verkovensky who's kind of putting forth these ideas that are possessing people. They're possessing people with new behaviors and new ways of thinking that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And the book is about how completely normal, completely moral, and completely Christian people can end up committing atrocious acts. Absolutely one of the most salient and one of the most important novels ever written, simply for its content. Does it have a lot of people sitting around and talking? Absolutely. Welcome to Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky does not write thrilling novels. I, in my opinion, they are. You have hilarious stuff. You have fascinating stuff. You have action. Brothers Karamazov is like rated NC-17 if it was a movie. Um, I think it's great. Dostoevsky uses the novel as a vehicle for a philosophical discussion. And the discussion is usually outlined in his letters or in his writer's diary. So it seems abstract. It seems concealed or surreal at times. It's, it's about morality. It's about all the things that we're thinking about anyway. What's the justification for murder? How does someone end up committing a murder? So it's, in many ways, the inversion of what we're used to. It's hard to describe what exactly happens in the novel. The beauty of it is Dostoevsky can take a novel about people, oh, money here and money that, love and so on, class and status, and can create this philosophical masterpiece. 
in this one, there's this this um, contention between Verkovensky and his former student and the son of his former student who comes to town one day. Very politically minded people, characters like Stavrogin and Kurilov. These characters have their own cult status outside of the book. People talk about Kirillov. What is he actually saying? Shigalyov um, is a character who, and we're getting we're getting to the um, why is Dostoevsky important, really? Shigalyov put forward a type of government, a government based really on opportunism, and it's described as, as this. It's a police state. It's marketed as a government of the people, but it really immediately consolidates its authority and becomes a downward oppressive force. It has secret police. It has surveillance. It has, it's a big brother society. It's 1984. This was described in a book that was published in 1871. Dostoevsky described the character, the nature, and in fact, the life cycle of the Soviet Union 50 years before the Bolshevik Revolution. Phenomenal. And this is something that people find it hard to accept, is that Dostoevsky could have done this. And as people are, and Dostoevsky, I believe, was allowed at times during the Soviet Union, maybe under Khrushchev or something like that. People would read it and say, what the hell? I mean, Bulgakov, who had to postpone the publication of this book for 20 years because of the Soviet Union. And this is essentially a love letter to Dostoevsky. Again, this is Master and Margarita, a phenomenal novel. Um, they're, they're mystified by the genius of Dostoevsky, absolutely uh, uh, anticipated all of it, partially because, and this is what people don't realize, is the czardom, the czar himself was pretty much like a Soviet leader. I mean, Dostoevsky and the Petrushevskys were caught by the secret police. There was surveillance. There was um, treason for any reason, you know. <laughs> You're treasonous because we said so, things like that. It's been, it was happening all throughout, even the gulag, the Siberian work camps of which, where Dostoevsky served. It's the same thing. I mean, the gulag was kind of new at the time in the 20th century, but it, it had been going on forever. Um, and it's just fascinating. The plot and everything, the characters, there's one uh, chapter that's very famous called At Tikons, which as again, was originally removed from the original edition uh, because the nature of it, this one right here, the content of it was too graphic, too serious. Um, he couldn't put it out there. I believe the original run was self-published out of his apartment, and he sold something like 3,000 copies with his own hand. Incredible. Um, I would read this one after you are comfortable with how Dostoevsky writes. If you start with Devils, you will never read another Dostoevsky novel again because um, it's a lot, and it's a Dostoevsky novel. But what we see with this one, for the first time is a direct emphasis on the philosophical discussion above all of it, all else. Crime and punishment comments on many things. I mean, this comments on plenty of things other. Uh, it comments on poverty, it comments on um, alcoholism, it comments on um, regret and guilt, um, especially um, with characters like Svidrigalov, one of the most important, one of the most significant and fascinating characters in all literature. Devils is really just Here's my, here's what I'm thinking about. And it's being activated. It's being explored through the characters more so than with Raskolnikov, more so than with um, the underground man who is in fact lecturing you. Um, this is really like, you're going to read this story so that you can access a higher level of conversation. That will be also kind of, um, um, it's a template for the brothers Karamazov, which will come about nine years later. During this time, I believe Dostoevsky is focusing on his writer's diary. He writes some short books. Uh, I forgot to mention White Nights is a phenomenal novella. Um, he writes Dream of a Ridiculous Man, The Adolescent, or The Raw Youth, as it's often called. His, his short stuff is phenomenal. If you really don't want to read that much, read Dream of a Ridiculous Man, which, by the way, was written in like 1877, but it sounds exactly like... Um, notes from the underground at the beginning of this long Dostoevsky and arc. Um, he never loses his edge. Finally, um, in the 70s there, his son, Alyosha, dies. It has, uh, it's a massive toll on him. 
Now, child, the death of children is more common at this time in history than today. There's no difference. The trauma is absolutely profound. Um, he begins to write a new type of book, and one of the main characters is named Alyosha. And this, this character, Alyosha, deals with a child who's actually sick and dying, named Ilyusha. Um, definitely a, um, a recognition of his son who passed away, and it really is dedicated to that. And you get the feeling that it is. The book is called The Brothers Karamazov, which we're now going to explore. Now, as you've already seen, I have it in digital. I just have to reference it a lot. I don't want to keep flipping the book and ruining my edition. My uh, translation is by Ignat Avzi, which is okay. Uh, he translates it as The Karamazov Brothers, whichever one you prefer. Avzi is fine. Um, the one I would recommend would be the Norton Critical Edition. Uh, it can be a bit expensive. The Avzi is more common. He does a great job. Avzi, I believe, is Latvian or was Latvian. Uh, and so it kind of has a natural uh, English and Russian, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, bend. And he can put forth a wonderful prose very easily. That, this is a very readable version of Brothers Karamazov. I would recommend the Avsi because it's an 800-page novel. Again, it does not feel like 800 pages. It's like a 300-page novel at 800 pages. Conversations are very fluid. It's a lot of text to just say normal things. Do not be daunted. I think it's a really readable text, even if it's long and complicated. The Brothers Karamazov is about a man named Fyodor Pavlovich, who is this landowner and he's an SOB. He has mistreated multiple wives through whom he's had multiple children. His children are all boys. They are the brothers. Um, so Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov first gives birth to Dmitry Fyodorovich Karamazov, who grows up to be this wild, debauching, sensualistic, um, father-hating character who's very histrionic and probably um, Bipolar. I mean, he's a representation of bipolar. He has moments of just indescribable ecstasy and moments of just rage and malice. The second son, uh, through the second wife, is named Ivan Fyodorovich Karamazov, a philosopher and literally a theologian. He is um, raised, again, all of them are raised away from their father. Who doesn't care about them? He neglects them. There's no support. These boys don't even necessarily see their mothers at all. They're estranged. Um, very, very strange. Ivan becomes well known for his theological views, primarily about um, Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiastic courts, which is going to feature heavily into a major part, of, a famous part of the book. Um, Ivan is very complicated. He seems innocuous. He might be one of the most insidious characters in the book. The third brother, the youngest, is named Alyosha. Alyosha is quiet, reserved, forgiving of everyone. He's like a monk from the time he's young. He is the only brother who at one point was held in his mother's arms and hushed. This is what sets him apart. He was put at peace at a very early age. Neither of his brothers had this. Dmitri is just angry at life. He has moments when he is so happy he says he could commit suicide on the spot. He's a fatalistic person. Everyone knows he's violent. He commits public acts of violence just out of pride or vanity. And yet at the same time, Dmitri is the most sober person in the book. He understands he's crazy. He understands all of this. You might say he's almost redeemed for that reason. In fact, if you've read the book correctly, he is redeemed. There's not a, a wicked hair in him, even if he has dragged someone by their beard, even if he has punched someone. It doesn't, it almost has no effect. Ivan abstains from all of these things, and yet you have these suspicions. He's actually been implicated in something extremely wicked. Uh, and then the third brother, Alyosha, again, is very aloof. He is involved, but he's more observing the relationships um, going on between these brothers. The father, Fyodor Pavlovich, and the son, Dmitri, are both in love with the same woman, Katerina Ivanovna, and then a woman named Grushenka. Grushenka is spiteful towards men. She wants to cause discord because of vengeance, a sense of vengeance and spite, which obviously it's a love triangle. Ivan is also trying to get with her. Oh my God, you know, so that, now here we are. And Alyosha is observing this. He barely knows his brothers. He barely knows his own father. 
and there's a servant in the household named Smerdyakov. This servant was the son of a, a mentally different woman named uh, Lizaveta Smerdyashenko or something like that. It means she smells, essentially. She smells like shit. She couldn't take care of herself. She was homeless. She would wander around town there, um, which is, by the way, it's a town connected to a monastery, which is very important. People would let her in their homes. I mean, they would take care of her to, to an extent. It's suggested at one point that Fedor Pavlovich, and this is not a spoiler, this is character building here at the beginning, actually, <laughs> um, uh, to not use a trigger word, has Congress with her, uh, almost in secret, almost on a dare, which produces a child that kills her through childbirth. Um, Fedor Pavlovich's main servant, named Grigory Vasilievich, who rejects his first child for having an extra finger, um, adopts this uh, boy, Smerdyakov, as he's called, the one who smells like the smelly woman, or the one who's like the smelly woman, his mother, um, adopts him as a child and says he is a child of God and kin to all. This act of mercy of allowing this child of a essentially a raped, retarded woman um, of a dismal fate. And, and again, he is a servant to his father growing up. He's literally the soup cook. Um, a soup stirrer, as Fedor Pavlovich calls him. Um, he learns theology. He learns the Bible and becomes very well-versed in it. He becomes so well-versed that he speaks aversely of it. He criticizes the Bible in front of Grigory Vasilievich, who is trying to raise him. He is literally physically abused because he's trying to argue against the word of God, which again gives him epilepsy. This is one of the strangest iterations and manifestations of Dostoevsky as the author in his own story. Smerdyakov has nothing but spite for the whole world. He doesn't care what it is. He is a pure contrarian. He is simply there to stir the soup, as Fyodor Pavlovich says, for no other reason than it gives him affirmation through spite. He seems acutely aware that what he that his old his own lot is to literally make food for his father who denies the blood of the, 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 this consanguinity. One of the most dismal fates of all time, and the reader immediately recognizes this dismal fate. You would sympathize with Smerdyakov, and it is very painful to read the early description of his character. And yet he is looked down on. He is practically abused by his brothers. He is he is accosted by them um, for speaking out of turn. Uh, immediately the reader, and this is the true point of the brothers Karamazov, the reader can immediately sense that Smerdyakov needs a helping hand. He's someone who could benefit from the benefit, from the benefit of the doubt. Um, and yet he is treated in this way. He becomes in this way a centrally wicked character with some help from other people. But you'll learn more about that later. Um, and again, um, Alyosha is kind of involved in all of this. He looks up to a local um, stiretz, or like a father of the monastery, uh, this major, um, how to say, a, pa a patriarch in the local monastery named Zosima. Uh, Father Zosima has this infinitely forgiving, this understanding attitude. People come to him saying, my child died, uh, what do I, how do I deal with this? And he gives these almost kind of dismissive, these very insightful um, injunctions to these people. And they seem completely innocuous in the very beginning, but they will be defining for everything that happens afterwards. Um, heinous acts are written off. It says, ah, don't, don't worry about it in a way. And people are almost offended by it. There's a point where the Karamazovs, Ivan Alyosha, yeah, I think there's Dimitri, no, Dimitri's not there. Fedor Pavlovich and their friends are in the cell of the stirrets, this, this head of the monastery. And Fedor Pavlovich is making a fool of himself, lampooning the Bible in front of this, this incredibly, this man who's devoted his life to God. Zosima is sitting there just indifferent. He does not blame people. He does not accost people. Um, and this will become very important. And so Alyosha looks up to him. Eventually, um, Alyosha meets a, um, a young boy. He is being bullied by other boys. Uh, this boy is named Ilyusha. The boys who are bullying him because he's mean, he's violent in class. This boy named Ilyusha, it turns out, about nine or ten years old, is dying. His father is a former captain in the military named Snigiryov. 
Snigiryov has a very interesting looking beard. Uh, Avzi uh, translates it as a lufa looking beard, which is a strange word. Constance Garnett uh, used the term wisp of toe, which is I think like a type of um, like a dried plant or something that has like, you know, it makes sense in Russian. Um, his beard is scraggly and it's, it's interesting. And uh, Dmitri, the older brother, finds out that he was going to send money. He was working for the love interest, I believe. Oh, no, he's working for Fyodor Pavlovich, I think, to pay off um, Grushenko. He, uh, Dmitri finds out that he was implicated in this, drags him by his beard in, in the middle of town so everyone sees him and shames him, essentially, uh, in doing so. And so Snigiryov has been shamed by the Karamazovs. Uh, Alyosha learns about this and confronts them in an extremely iconic and an extremely moving chapter. Um, and there's, a, there's an incredible scene right after that. Um, and if, if for nothing else, just get to this chapter and you will absolutely be hooked to this book. Um, and again, a lot of this book in the very beginning, there's like 130 pages of introduction. Absolutely none of that is filler. As you're reading it, you are reading philosophical exposition. No part of this book, not a word in the Brothers Karamazov is wasted. Everything is a conversation about religion, faith, redemption, and true grace, the, the true nature of God's grace. How does it occur? Um, at one point, an iconic chapter is when Alyosha sits down with Ivan. Ivan is a, th a theologian, don't forget. Ivan has a long poem called The Grand Inquisitor, which is sometimes published on its own, separate from the novel. It's one of the most iconic things that Dostoevsky has ever written. It's about during in the Inquisition period in Catholic Europe, I believe in the 1500s, there's a Grand Inquisitor who is visited by Christ in his second coming. The Inquisitor accosts Jesus for giving them this horrendous system in which uh, people worship this, this order of power rather than ascending to true faith. Jesus is held as a, an apostate. He's held as a sinner in the world that, has, that Christianity has become. This is also a criticism of Catholicism, um, but which Dostoevsky hated Catholicism. He says it throughout all of his books. <laughs> um, uh, but don't, don't worry about that. Um, and at the end of it, and I won't say what Jesus does at the end, but um, it's one of the most moving things about religion, I think, ever written. Um, it's based on, for example, the idea, as Dostoevsky even writes in his letters, um, that a man cannot live on bread alone. This is Dostoevsky's key criticism of communism, socialism, and nihilism. You cannot live materialistically alone. You need spiritual exposition. You need spiritual exploration, rather. Um, you need God in your life. You need philosophy. You need, essentially, to appreciate something um, and to have something to do and think about, have a project of the soul. Um, simply creating a system of bread, of, of perfect health, of things going right, is a kind of slavery. This is something that the Inquisitor accuses Jesus of, but really the reader knows it's the Inquisitor who works for the system the system that is exploiting people's faith, and it's the exploitation of faith that is truly wicked. But again, redemption and forgiveness is a major portion of this book, as you will find out. Um, despite having these very scary ideas, Alyosha just kisses his brother and leaves, um, which is not as weird as it sounds now. Um, absolutely incredible. There's a scene towards the end of the book, and just telling you about this is... Um, uh, is it a spoiler? I'm not sure. It's Ivan uh, in a very crazed state. He becomes, he starts to lose it at the end. Has a conversation with a hallucination of Satan that is possibly one of the most important bodies of text in all literature. It's a universal just um, expression where the devil says that he serves simply to meddle in the world. He's so used to living in the material in the human world, he doesn't even remember being in heaven at any point. Um, in the Brothers Karamazov, there's a massive distinction between the spiritual life and the physical one, or the material one. This is Dostoevsky's primary point throughout his entire life. You cannot base your life purely on materialistic intrigue. You need to have a spiritual life. 
It is the only way to attain God's grace. It is the only way to approach God. As if we're all born in this narrow hallway. And all we can do is advance further and further down into our own hubris and continue making these mistakes that we can't help. But the, the, the validation of faith in this book is that on the other side of the wall, he says, God is definitely there. So that no matter what you do, you can be aware that God or the Spirit of Christ is truly there with you. If you put your hand to the wall, essentially, if you enjoin faith, and Dostoevsky doesn't write this, this is what I'm coming up with. Um, if you enjoin faith, you will be saved. And it's a life that is far more euphoric. It's, it's a far greater revelation than simply trying to live materialistically. And finally, throughout all of this, from the very beginning, Dostoevsky essentially argues he lampoons rational logic in this book. He throws rational logic against the wall and shoots it. I mean, in, in, in a courtroom scene towards the end, the things the lawyers are saying, that there is rational, deductive people, is ridiculous. It's not reality. Um, Dostoevsky rejects rational logic as a basis for philosophy and a basis for living your life. Um, if for nothing else, this is why The Brothers Karamazov was Einstein's favorite book. This is why it was Wittgenstein's favorite book, Lenin's favorite book. Everyone who's someone in the 20th century worshipped the brothers Karamazov, Freud, Jung, um, everyone, everyone you like, they, fa they were fascinated by the brothers Karamazov. Uh, the, the, this distinction between the meaning, the purpose, the spiritual world in existence that is completely intangible and completely invisible which is far more real to us, which is far more present than these material projects that go nowhere. If you follow rational logic, if you follow human civilization, our own institutions, even our own customs, the idea that I need to have this woman, the idea that I can use money to leverage what I want, the idea that if you just pursue a material life, you'll be perfectly fine absolutely ends in tragedy every single time and this is the brothers karamazov again just like crime and punishment just like um, the idiot far from a dry read one of the most frenetic one of the most beautifully written texts i think of all time i would say the brothers karamazov might be one of the greatest books of all time it might be the greatest novel ever who knows um it has some of the most iconic quotes of all time. Um, I will leave you with this one now. And I think that you should definitely get to the brothers Karamazov after a while, in which Dmitri, in the beginning of the book, tells his brother Alyosha that beauty is a thing that is both terrible and alluring. And within it, God and the devil are at war, and the battlefield is the heart of man. One of the most iconic quotes of all time. I do hope that this short or long discussion has actually influenced you to approach Dostoevsky a little bit more seriously. This channel will have many more videos about Dostoevsky in the future. I might make its own playlist for that reason. Um, I would like to thank you all for watching and listening. Please check out the description for a lot of important stuff. Uh, other channels who um, go into Dostoevsky and do a great job of addressing him. The translation